Alrighty, good day everyone. I'm here to talk to you about Ambient, the open source cross-platform multiplayer game runtime that we built over the last two years. First off, let me introduce myself. My name is Bethun, but I go by Philpax Online. That's my avatar over there. You can find me on Twitter or Mastodon over there. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Ambient, which is a startup looking to advance Rust game dev. Before Ambient, I worked at Avalanche Studios as a AAA game dev. In my free time, I work on open source AI, including LLM.RS, a Rust library for using large language models locally. Now, I have to admit something to you before we start. We're not actually currently working at the runtime. Cool technology doesn't always make for a cool product. Because of that, this talk will be split into two sections, what Ambient is and why it didn't quite work out. So, what is the Ambient runtime? Multiplay game development is challenging. Most of the existing solutions are lacking in some way. They don't support multiplayer, they aren't cross-platform, or they limit the developer's creativity. We wanted to solve this problem and make it easy for people to build <coughs> multiplayer games. Of course, that took a few tries. What you're seeing here is a first attempt to solve multiplayer game development. This is DIMS, a collaborative, low-code game development platform, also built in Rust. You can build worlds and hang out with together. Worlds aren't games, though. To bring them to life, we decided to let you script your games with WebAssembly. And then we realized it was becoming something else entirely. So we took the core of DIMS, cleaned it up, and open sourced it to create Ambient. Once that was done, we then added a package manager, ported it to the web, and built a cloud platform around it. That is to say, Ambient is a modern, open source, multiplayer first, cross platform game runtime with WebAssembly scripting, web support, and a package centric workflow. All of this is backed by a cloud platform, the Ambient platform that allows people to build, publish, play, and share packages and games. And of course, all of this is written in Rust, and I mean all of it. The game server, the desktop client, the web client, the scripting, the build automation, the cloud services, the website, the crab comes for us all. <laughs> Today, I'll be primarily talking about the runtime. The website was written in the Dioxys, but that's a talk for another day. <laughs> so, why Rust? A game engine requires performance, and the typical answer is C++, but we chose Rust. We wanted a safe and performant language with modern conveniences. We wanted the tooling. We wanted Cargo, Clippy, Rust format. We wanted native support for concurrency and parallelism. We wanted a rich, reliable package ecosystem. We wanted to be able to confidently re refactor code with ease, and we wanted a strong type system, including enums, traits, and more, all backed by the almighty borrow checker. Of course, these all make, make it much easier to write cross-platform code, especially with Rust crates. 99.999% of our code was the same between Ru uh, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Rust is also a fantastic general purpose language, which is why we used it for everything else. This allowed us to easily share code and do more with less. Now, let's talk features. We're a batteries included runtime, so we made sure your engine had everything you might need to build a game, as you can see here. The most innovative items on this list are the packages, WASM scripting, and web support. Let's start with the packages. Like many modern game engines, we use an entity component system, an ECS, in which entities have components, which are pieces of data, and these entities and the components are acted upon by systems. However, we wanted to go a step further. I grew up with Gary's mod, in which you could load code and assets at runtime to extend the game experience. We wanted to build the modern equivalent, which led us to a runtime level of packages, which were inspired heavily by Rust crates, as you can see from the tunnel. These can add new components, bring in new assets, load new asset modules, and even message each other. And of course, they can depend on other packages. The best way to demonstrate this is, of course, with a demo. I'm going to do two demos. Wish me luck. First up, let's look at an example that uses a package. So, if I can bring that over there. Excellent. Cool. So you can see here, this is our TOML file for a package. We have all the standard metadata, so name, description, version, etc. And we also have our dependencies. Now, I'm not going to show you the code for this yet, because I just want to show you what it's like to actually run it. So I hit ambient run, just like cargo run, brings up our nice game here. And I can just drag this over here. And then I can hit up a second client with ambient join and bring that over there. And with that, we now have two clients in the same world, two commands, easy as that. Now, if I hop over to server.rs, we have a client-server model in which all clients connect to a server, and the clients and the server each have their individual code. These are uh, WebAssembly binaries, so 
You can put in whatever you want as long as you can compile it. More on that later. And you can see that this is actually relatively simple. Uh, we have our API imports. Um, we have our package imports. And then we have our entities being spawned here. Uh, we have a floor, a sphere, a sun, an atmosphere. And then when a player joins, we give them a third-person controller, a model, some animations, and some nameplates. And you can see that like a few dozen lines is enough to get you an experience like this. Now, you might be thinking, yeah, but you hit all of that in the, the dependencies. And that's true, we did. But the idea here, here is that you can build it upon this yourself. You can extend this with what you need. And to illustrate that, I am going to bring over my Chrome window here. So this is the ambient Rust API. It's on crates.io, nothing special there. Uh, you can see you have access to all these wonderful functions and modules you can use. The main one being the entity module in which you can use all these functions to interact with entities. Uh, have a look around when you have some time. But more interestingly, we actually have our own cargo doc equivalent. It's very bare bones, but you can actually look at your package and its docs and see what it imports, what you can use with it, uh, and so on. So for example, you can see that a third-person camera example, the one we were just looking at, actually has a third-person controller import. And here you can see the components that are available, the concepts, which are like bundles and bevy. And you know exactly what you need to fill in in order to make this work. And of course, there's nothing special about the core definitions. The core definitions are just another package. So everything that you can uh, use with an ECS is also available here. So you can see, uh, for example, that uh, the player attributes, the components, are also available here. We try not to do too much magic here. We want it to be uh, as above, so below. Like, the core definitions are the same as your definitions. OK, so that's demo one over. That is the third person controller. Now, let's move on to demo two. So here is the Ambient website. I'll start here from the beginning. Uh, nice, big, modern website with big text, as you might expect. Uh, just to illustrate, the packages are here are real, available here in assets. So the third person controller we were looking at is here as well. But the main thing we're looking at here are, are the games. So these games are also packages. They have dependencies on other packages, and they have their own code. And the game we're looking at today is Tangent, which is a flagship experimental game where we shove all the new tech in to see if it works. So if this works, yep, we're loading into a session of Tangent. This is all backed by a multiplayer server. And as, as you can see, it's running in the browser. No magic there. We didn't have to install anything. This is all web GPU. I can hop in and start running around. But of course, you, need, you, can't, you can't just take my word for it that it's a multiplayer. So I am going to hop over here into my third terminal and join the very same session. And you can see here that I have now joined the session as Silly Bob, uh, Blobfish. And obviously, you can't really tell. Oh, I should probably close these fellas as well. My poor MacBook can only handle so many games at the same time. Yep, uh, so you can't really tell that this is the same map because it's so big, but we have a trick for that. So this is Tangent, there are two players in it. What we can actually do is hit F4 to bring up the mod manager. Now, the mod manager is not special, it's actually packaging itself. The idea being that we didn't want a, you know, a special case this, we wanted you to be able to you know, meta build the same way we do. So this package manager, we can now drop in Fire Rain, which is a mod that changes the sky to Fire Red and throws a constant stream of meteoroids at players. Immediately, uh, immediately affected, and you can see we're also affected here. This is the same session, and if I stick here for long enough, I'll probably die. So that is a tangent demo. Nothing magical, uh, same game, and I mean the same game. Like, we upload the same assets, and it runs the same on both the desktop and the web. That is the magic of our tech stack. So let me close this before my laptop runs out of battery, <laughs> and let's head back to the presentation. OK, as you might have noticed in the demo, we use Rust as a scripting language. This is made possible through WebAssembly. More on that later. We liked using Rust for scripting, and it share, let us share a lot of code, which is fantastic when we were changing things around. However, the language is still somewhat complex, even despite our API's efforts to simplify it. The compile times are OK, but not fantastic. Game developers appreciate fast iteration times, and Rust doesn't always provide that. We also had concern that Rust might scare off potential users. We found users were fine with it once they were used to it, but it was definitely a barrier to entry. We think a slightly higher level language might be better for this use case, 
but we're not sure what that would look like. Maybe Grain, which is like a ML-like targeting WebAssembly. Pretty cool, check it out. Now, let's talk about some code generation we do. As you saw before, our packages define components in TOML format. The core ambient definitions are also a package. You can see an example of that here. That's actually a core definition within the source code. And of course, both engine code and guest code need access to the things defined by packages. That's where the code generation comes in. These definitions are consumed by a semantic system, which will then unify them and determine how all the packages link together. Our semantic system is just a library, so it can be used by the engine at runtime and by guest code at build time. You can see an example of what the system outputs here. It's just like getting a dump of um, like uh, classes from your IDE or whatever. Once it's in that representation, it's easy enough to emit Rust code for it. We initially used procedural macros for this, but we switched to build scripts because Rust analyzer struggled. You've, you've all seen this with proc macros. It can do well, but it, some, some, sometimes it struggles. And our users appreciated being able to see the generated code. These files are placed in SRC, not out there, to make it easier to see. This is not recommended by the Rust documentation, but it seems to work. Essentially, we've added another stage to the Rust compilation pipeline to integrate the ambient interface definition language. This is not unlike Pavex from yesterday. Anyway, if you've been keeping count, you can see that we have a lot of moving parts. Rust workspaces ha do a pretty good job of grouping together packages, but they don't support cross toolchain tool chain packages, that is mixing desktop and WASM, and they don't support nesting. Rust Analyzer works with a workspace you have in the directory you have open in your IDE. This means that we could have up to five VS Code windows open, the native client, the web client, the guest code, the cloud services, and this website. That's obviously a bit of a struggle. To help with this, we use the Cargo X task pattern. We built a tool in Rust in our root workspace, Campfire, that could handle meta deployment, uh, development tasks like building all the clients, updating package versions, deploying the packages, and more. This is then aliased using cargo config toml to make it easy to access. This was an upfront cost, but it paid for itself many times over, especially as we were targeting Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and the web. And I gotta say, it's a lot better than shell scripts. Unlike shell scripts, this actually works on Windows. <laughs> okay, for testing, our primary solution was the use of golden image tests. We would run a test case, wait a few seconds, take a screenshot, and then compare it to a reference image. Using software rendering, we were able to run this in our CI. This worked pretty well, but it had some drawbacks. Software rendering is very slow and unstable, and the test was still brittle due to networking, rendering, timing, and randomness issues. We considered more complex tests, like having a sequence of operations and using a GPU-based CI runner, but we didn't have the time to implement them. So now it's time to discuss the elephant in the room. What went wrong? <laughs> First off, a fairly surface level thing, our packages are defined by TOML. Unfortunately, TOML gets pretty ugly <laughs> for uh, complex structures, especially because TOML 1.0 can't do multi-line literals. You can see that it's like the component definition there. It does not look good. I wanted to do domain-specific language to define your schema, but there just wasn't enough time. Next up, if you've talked to any game developer, you'll have heard the standard device, don't build your own engine. Rust solves many problems, but, but it doesn't solve that one. <laughs> We are a small team of less than 10 with limited resources, and building an engine from scratch is a huge undertaking. We were able to innovate in ways that existing engines couldn't, but everything else suffered. There are parts of our engine that saw love, no love for months, sometimes years. On top of that, we were also building an ecosystem, which meant we were constantly updating the documentation, examples, platform, and more. Was it fun? Yes. Was it sustainable? Maybe not. But the biggest technical challenge we faced by far, was supporting the runtime to the web. We decided on web support after we'd already built the desktop client. Most other engines would struggle with this, but we had a secret weapon, or so we thought, Rust native support for WebAssembly. As ambient is, modul as ambient is modular, we created a new web client targeting WASM32 unknown unknown, and progressively added ambient's crates to it. We created a new client to ensure only the essentials were uh, included, and to reduce the scope of any potential discrepancies. We believed that this would be straightforward. We had already built on top of uh, WGPU and WInit, which would abstract over platform specifics. That's all we need to do, right? It can't be that simple, right? It was not. The web is a different beast. It has different constraints, different APIs, and different performance constraints. Many of the assumptions we'd made about the desktop didn't hold up on the web. Support for the latest APIs is not universal. Chrome was the only browser that supported everything we needed, and it didn't support them on Linux. 
WebAssembly goes a long way towards shrinking the performance discrepancy between web and desktop, but there is still a gap. Multi-threading on the web is still very much a work in progress, and debugging is very, very difficult, especially with async code. So, to be more specific, let's dig into the troubles we faced. First off, the platform itself. WASM32, unknown, unknown. The standard Rust target for WASM on the web is a convenient lie that we tell ourselves. Much of the standard library will panic at runtime, and many APIs are missing. You must use WASM bind gen and WebSys to interact with JS APIs and replace the missing functionality. <coughs> Our existing code used uh, targeted Tokyo, which has limited support for running on the web. Additionally, you don't control task scheduling on the web, unlike on desktop. To fix all of that, we needed to write our own system abstraction that smoothed over the differences between the desktop and the web. This abstraction covered async tasks, timing, file I.O., the clipboard, and more. We had to make sure that any code that could potentially run the web at any point used this abstraction, otherwise it would panic. We used Clippy and Cargo Deny to help, to help with this, but we still ran to plenty of cases where we did have panics and we did have to troubleshoot them. Next up, graphics. From the start, we have been using WGPU, which is a fantastic abstraction of the various graphics APIs, including WebGPU. We wanted a relatively modern look, so nothing that looked like it was from the 90s or the 2000s, and we wanted to be able to use the same code in both the web and the desktop. We were under the impression that using WGPU would make porting to the web and using WebGPU relatively straightforward. It did make it easier, I'm not gonna deny that, but well, they're not quite the same thing. Let's quickly go over the problems we encountered. Our renderer was designed around having many bind groups, and we had to partially redesign it when we discovered that WebGPU only supports a few bind groups at a time. We relied on extensions that, are, that aren't present in the web. We expected this, but it still hurts. WebGPU support across browsers is basically limited to Windows and Mac OS Chrome. There is no support for Linux or any non-Chromium browsers like Firefox. Each browser has a slightly different interpretation of the spec, and their interpretation can differ from WGPU's native implementation, especially in how they compile shaders. And finally, debugging, as you might come to expect by now, is very difficult. The standard tools don't work, and you're not debugging WebGPU, you're debugging your browser's interpretation of WebGPU. The port we budgeted two weeks for ended up taking two months, and it doesn't work for a sizable fraction of our audience. In hindsight, we should have just targeted WebGL, even if it came at the crush of uh, graphical fidelity. We wanted to bring native-like rendering to the web, but it's just not there yet. For networking, we use the Quinn library, which implements the Quick protocol. Quick is a fantastic protocol that provides secure, reliable, and unreliable data streams, making it perfect for us. Web transport is a sibling protocol of Quick that shares a great deal with it, and the majority of browsers have native client support for it. We assumed that having the web client use, uh, we use web transport to connect to the server would be straightforward. Unfortunately, just like the web GPU, it's not quite the same thing. Web transport is a separate protocol from Quick and has its own API. There was no existing support for web transport on the server in Rust, so we worked with Dario, an open source contributor, to add web transport support to H3. As you might imagine, this took a while. We also had to add a web transport backend to a client but as Quinn and the web transport JS APIs are relatively similar, this wasn't too bad. But you know what was? After all this, we discovered that networking, rendering, and logic all run on the same thread on the web. Remember, there's no multi-threading, which meant that all the messages that, we, that came through would be dropped if the client was too busy. Much of this came from our WASM scripting solution on the web having severe overhead. More on that in the next slide. This was catastrophic, and we added a few workarounds including dropping frames to allow networking to catch up, but we don't have a general solution for it yet. All right, let's move on to the scripting side of things. I've built my fair share of scripting applications, and I've typically done this with Lua or other languages amenable to embedding. A problem that I've always encountered while doing so, however, is you're locked into uh, whatever language you embedded. The only way to add more languages is to add more interpreters, which is very cumbersome. This time around, though, we decided to use WebAssembly for scripting, which is a language-independent bytecode format, and despite what the name suggests, you can use it outside of the web. First problem, first problem though, how do you actually run WebAssembly? On the web, you can just use the browser's WebAssembly runtime, at least in theory, but we needed a way to run it natively. 
There are a couple of interpreters, but we chose the Bicrit Alliance as a WASM time for this, as it has a JIT compiler, natively supports Rust, and is at the forefront of WASM development. In doing so, however, we discovered our second problem. How do you actually bind Rust types to WebAssembly, which only has a C-like ABI? Luckily, the Bicrit Alliance have a solution for this, Wit BindGen. Unluckily, it was still in development when he picked it up and we discovered it was a part of the greater component model proposal, which was still being designed. This meant that we were following a changing implementation and spec, which led to churn on our part. The interface is specified in WIT, which is an interface de definition language uh, for the component model. It supports a subset of what Rust supports in its type, type system, which meant we had to be careful in how we designed our API. In addition to this, WIT did not absolve us of having to write glue code. We still have to write glue code in both the host and the guest to wrap the WIT code to make it ergonomic to use. As you can see, those WIT methods are there, but we have wrappers around them. In hindsight, we should have considered writing our own binding layer. WIT is great, but it wasn't the right fit for our constraints. And I can show you some files later to show you exactly why that is. Uh, also, WIT BindGen only supports a few languages, and having to write additional glue code is effectively limited, uh, limited us to Rust because we didn't have the time for anything else. Next up, remember how I said that WASM32 <coughs> unknown unknown doesn't implement any system interfaces? Luckily, that's less of a problem for our guest code. We can use WASM32 WASI, which uses the WebAssembly system interface. Our engine, the host, can then implement the host side of the interface so that the guest can use his APIs without a care in the world. Rust supports the first version of WASI, but our use of the component model forces us to use the second version of the, uh, the second preview of WASI, which is still in uh, development. This meant that we had to use an adapter and have our own custom implementation of the WASI APIs. The APIs also were changing, so this was another source of churn for us. Okay, that's the desktop done. So we have WASM time, we have WetBindGen, <laughs> it's working, that's cool. Now, let's move on to the web. We use WASM time and WitBindGen on the desktop, but we don't need them on the web, right? We can just use the browser's runtime, right? Well, yes, but actually no. <laughs> Our guest code uses WASM32 WASI and the component model, neither of which are supported on the web. We had to add a web backend to our WASM implementation and then add support for the component model to the backend. Native support for components on the web will come, but it doesn't exist yet, so we had to figure out a solution for that. Luckily, another devel developer, Corel, had already encountered this problem and built Wasm Bridge, which is an open source library, which you can see there. We added the missing features required for our use case to Wasm Bridge, which let us finally run our guest code on the web. We're very grateful for Carol's work on Wasm Bridge, and we're happy to have contributed to it. But Wasm Bridge is based upon the PyCode Alliance's JCO project, which wraps WebAssembly components in a JS object. Watson Bridge wraps the resulting JavaScript code with a Rust interface. The problem with this is that all FFI goes through JavaScript, which is very, very slow. <laughs> we optimized this as much as we could, but we came to the conclusion that we needed to remove the JS from the equation. This was the main cause of our performance issues on the web. We then found Douglas Dwyer's WASM component layer, which provides a runtime agnostic implementation of the component model. We started contributing to it to fill in the holes, and we were in the process of switching to it. However, we were unable to complete this before we pushed development on Ambient. There were, of course, other issues we encountered with WebAssembly. Debugging is difficult. It is theoretically possible. We had it working outside of Ambient, but we couldn't get it working inside of Ambient you are forced to use print debugging. Wasm time compiles modules as you, as you load them, which takes time. With many modules, it can stall startup for many seconds as you fill with tangent. There is no way to quickly interpret code. You have to compile a module. Finally, we never did get, to ra get around to trying out new languages, or other languages even. This basically means there was no point in using WebAssembly. <laughs> in conclusion, WebAssembly shows promise for this use case, but like WebGPU, the pieces still need to come together. You can't run many scripting relevant languages on it. Binding is difficult, and supporting both desktop and web is very challenging. 
we'd recommend a conventional scripting lang language like Lua, Ruby, Python, uh, or uh, you know, even if you want to be wild, Lisp, especially as all those now have Rust implementations. Finally, our biggest issue is that people just weren't interested. We built a lot of cool tech, but we couldn't get people to care. I believe that with enough time, we could have made this work, but we just couldn't spend that time. And because of that, we're currently working on something new. I can't tell you what it is just yet, but I can say it's still related to game dev. So, what did we learn from all this? We are confident that Rust was the right choice, of uh, right, right choice for this engine, and we are continuing it to use it in our new projects. We just didn't know what we wanted to build, and we were subject to the limitations of technologies beyond our control. By the time that Ambient was born, Bevy and other engines were actively developed and were closer to what we needed. We should have investigated how much work it would have been to switch to them. We tried to retroactively add web support, but this should have been a core part of the engine from the beginning. At a minimum, we should have gone with more, con um, I mean, sorry, a more conventional scripting language and WebGL over WebAssembly and WebGPU. These are fantastic technologies, but they're just not ready yet. WebAssembly's ecosystem is still maturing, and WebGPU has growing pains. Finally, we needed to meet people where they were. We built all this cool technology, but we couldn't convince people to use it. We needed to talk to users first and solve the problems they had, not the problems we thought they had. Anyway, that was a lot quicker than I thought it would be, so thanks for listening. You can find us at ambient.run or at the GitHub repo. We're not actively working at the right time at this time. You can find me at Twitter at philpax or at master.on there. I'll take questions now and maybe do a few extra demos, but I'll be at the conference for the rest of the day if you'd like to talk more. All right, you're up.